Nice. I like that. And Daniel, can you keep an eye on uh, Tim? Yes. Thank you. There he is. Hey, Tim. Hey there. How's everybody doing? Hey. hey. Good to see you, Tim. I'm Daniel. Daniel, nice how are you, you doing? Doing great. Hey, thank you. Daniel, I, I hear I hear one of our uh, staff members is part of your group. Is sorry, I can't quite hear you. We were. Uh, I couldn't. Stop. I couldn't hear you, Tim. Um, I was just wondering, do you know who from the, the uh, Good Chris uh, company is uh, a member with you all? Um, yeah, I mean, I th well, I think uh, there are a couple people who are probably in the community. I don't know specifically who, but I know I know Matt. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, I, I, I was I was asking around and nobody seemed to know. Who. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Um. Cool. All right. Um, these are all the panelists, right? No, are we waiting on? Anyone? No, we are good. Cool. Okay, good. We're all situated. We're recording. I see people are starting to trickle in. What's up, everybody? We'll get started in just a few minutes. So are there any um, emerging brands that you guys have in your pantries or fridges? Any of your favorites? Well, good, good crisp, obviously. Um, yeah. Love, love the chips. <laughs> I don't have it in my pantry, but I've tried it when I was in uh, Denver last time. Oh, yeah. I want to try the new, the new one. The, I, I don't know what it's called. I don't know what that the new one's called, but the one, not the Pringles. Are you talking about the one? The, the, the crinkle the, the crinkle cut yeah the yeah 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 i want to try that yeah that's that's been uh that's been going well oh good yeah it looks amazing um hello everybody i see people trickling in here we'll probably just wait maybe a minute and get started here um and i'm just tim I, i'm just putting you on mute when you're not talking tim because there's some background noise where you are um and then you can, uh, you should be able to just unmute yourself when you're ready to chat. Um, and Daniel, you can see the slide, right? I can see the slide. Yes, we're good. And um, yeah, I think we can. I think we can probably get started. It's uh, one here, top of the hour. So, um, hello everybody. I'm Daniel. I am the startup CPG founder. And I don't always jump in to host webinars, but I really wanted to do this one um, just because I'm a big fan of Sin7. Um, and the last company that I worked with, we did our research. We asked around, asked consultants that I know what's the best option for emerging brands, for inventory management, you know, as we started to grow and just could not deal with trying to keep track of all the ingredients that we needed based on production and when to order them and how much were we going to be sitting on when we needed to reorder all that stuff. Um, and over and over again, everybody just said that the best thing out there was the Sin 7 product. It used to be called Deer and now it's called Core. Um, so I uh, relentlessly pursued Sin7 to join us uh, with Startup CBG as a sponsor, and they finally agreed. So I'm really excited that we've now kicked off the partnership with them. Um, so 
this, we, what we like to do is educational stuff because like this content is going to be really useful for everybody. It's just going to be mainly about inventory management in general and to help you guys kind of get up to speed on it. Um, they do have a super cool offer being a startup CPG partner where you can get a free month trial and then 50% off the first three months after that. So if you're thinking about it, I definitely encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, and with that, I think I'll um, introduce our speakers and we can um, kick off here. Um, so can I pass to you guys to first introduce yourselves and then we'll just jump right into the slides. And I'll also note that I we, we do have a question, a Q&A open. Um, so you can put your questions in there. If it's a broadly applicable question, often I'll jump in so that we can ask it. If it's a very specific one, uh, we may save it for the end or try to, to do it written. Um, but let's let's uh, kick it off here. Um, Ajoy, should I pass to you first for introductions? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Uh, with that introduction, you probably should be doing this webinar instead of me. <laughs> but uh, but love that love that story about uh, keeping track of stuff and whatnot, which hopefully we'll spend some time talking about today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here uh, and uh, appreciate the opportunity, Daniel and Startup CPG community, uh, for uh, for having us in this webinar, but also looking forward to a more productive partnership between Sin7 and Startup CPG. Uh, my name is Ajoy Krishnamurti. I'm the Chief Product Officer um, at, uh, at Sin7. I look after the product portfolio, but also largely uh, our investment priorities, uh, where we take the product. Uh, from a broader vision standpoint, keeping track of what's happening in the industry. And uh, and we do all of that uh, not in a vacuum, but uh, working very closely with uh, with our customers. Talking about, uh, talking about our customers, one such customer is actually Tim, who is joining us on the call here. Um, before I hand it off over to him, he's also part of our uh, product advisory councils. This is something that we are super passionate about. We have a community of customers that are part of a council that helps us define what the product roadmap needs to be. We are super transparent. We share our backlog. We meet on a monthly basis, but also have some ad hoc, ad hoc conversations along the way. They're also part of our Slack channel community. So I want to say a big thanks uh, to Tim for spending his time you know, during that uh, uh, engagement, but also for jumping in today. Tim, I know you are a startup CPG member. Sin7 customer also have a CPG brand. I think I can't find a better guest than Tim. Uh, to join and share his experience. So Tim, uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you for your introduction. Hey, hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, and I appreciate it, Joy and Stephen pulling me in. Um, I, I started working uh, with the, the firm when it was called Deer, uh, as, as uh, you had heard earlier. That was back in, in 2019. I was, was basically thrown into uh, the system and was told I'd become the expert for the company. Uh, that was back when uh, the CPG or the uh, CBD companies were all in, in heavy growth. And I went in with them <laughs> and I learned quite a bit about the system. Um, and and uh, when I decided to move on, I was very shocked when I saw that the Good Crisp company uh, had indicated, well, they were using Deer. I thought, oh, well, this will be good. So uh, yeah, it's been very exciting with them um, I'm, I'm in the finance role, the VP of finance. I uh, started out actually in, in, in manufacturing in the automobile and, and motorcycle business uh, years ago before moving on into sporting goods and CPG, which I've been doing for the past nine years now with a variety of different brands. All right. Awesome. Cool. Um, Steven, do you want to say a quick hello also? Yeah, yeah. So Steven Sugg right here. I'm a director of digital marketing at Sin7. I'm here to help kind of answer questions as a joy talks and, and hopefully keep him in line if he gets out of line too. So um, <laughs> won't be doing too much talking, but um happy to be a part of this partnership. Uh thanks, guys. Cool. All okay. right, let's rip, let's rip into it. Enjoy awesome. all I'll you. Say, I'll say challenge accepted, Steven. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, and again, as, as Daniel said, please uh, pipe in with some questions along the way. And hopefully we'll have some time towards the end as well. And what we thought we'll set up uh, this uh, conversation because, you know, the spirit of this uh, conversation is about sharing a bit of uh, knowledge around how we think about inventory and the importance of inventory management uh, in the context of a lot of your emerging growing businesses, right? And, uh, you know, when I, when I talk about inventory management, before we dive into the what, the why, and the how, one of the key things to keep in mind for all of us, which I know you're all in the forefront, uh, seeing this day in and day out, and not just as a CPG business owner, 
uh, or on part of the emerging organization, but also as a consumer. One of the things that we have seen um, is a big shift in how easy it is to buy stuff, right? We all as consumers have gone through this and particularly the pandemic also put a big step function uh, change in how we consume products and how we buy products, how we get that delivered. And we have seen significant uh, uh, changes that have happened over the course of last decade, particularly last three to five years in terms of online ordering, um, in terms of things like BOPUS, which was an acronym that did not exist probably three years ago. Now it's uh, super prevalent in the in the retail space, uh, which is buy online, pick up in store. You know, we all, I'm sure, have gone through and uh, did some curbside pickup and whatnot. And then the recent trend, which uh, I think we have seen some penetration with uh, social channels like Facebook and Instagram driving sales. And one of the newer ones in the block from a shopping experience standpoint is TikTok, where people are able to come in and look at the products in a video and the ability to go from that to just pick a particular shoe or a jacket that a artist is wearing in a TikTok video to be able to add it to a shopping cart and buy. Um, tremendous uh, traction there. In fact, I was looking at a survey recently uh, of uh, target customers in that age group. Uh, 50 some percent are saying that they, have, they are going to be shopping at uh, TikTok. And uh, it was 62% for Facebook. So for a brand that introduced shopping less than what, three, four months ago, Super impressive to see that type of penetration happening. And we're going to see, continue to see changes like this, right? And, and that's all exciting for us. You know, people that we're all in the uh, CPG product business, you know, we have a platform in the product seller space. Super exciting to see that. But then if you flip, flip the coin, if somebody is buying, somebody got to be selling something, right? What is happening from a selling standpoint? Is selling has become as easy as uh, buying? Um, there are things that we need to do uh, from... Uh, how we think about uh, stocking our inventory to tracking our inventory to uh, fulfilling the orders that comes in, the channels that we work with. Uh, fundamentally, a lot of that uh, requires a level of thinking and planning. And uh, if done right, those will become a big driver of growth for organizations like yourselves. So let's start with the core thing here, which is the, the meat of this topic right, or the session today, which is inventory management. Right, you know, for all of you, I'm sure many of you are doing this and tracking this and uh, spending time in various, uh, I guess, a spectrum from a sophi sophistication standpoint. So I wanted to just do a quick level set and talk through, you know, when we say inventory manage, what do we mean by that, right? So we'll just do some a quick one-on-one here so we get the, the key concepts across and get all of us uh, on, on the same uh, playing field. When we talk about inventory, we're talking about all of these different kinds, right? You know, Daniel mentioned the ability to know uh, if I'm getting all the uh, the raw materials uh, or the ingredients that I need to make produce something. Uh, what is it stuck? What does the production schedule look like? Would I get it enough uh, in time to be able to offer the finished goods? So it starts with that from raw materials. If you happen to be a manufacturing, or you if you're just even doing an assembly, disassembly, right? You buy bulk products of A and bulk products of B and create a bundle of A and B together and sell it. Uh, do you have enough of product A and B to create the bundle C, right? How do you keep track of all of that? Finished goods is obviously what you get done. Uh, tracking work in progress, right? How much of the inventory is actually being produced and what does the timeline look like? And then also having visibility into what's in transit. There is this notion of inventory at rest and inventory in motion. Um, I'm sure some of you have uh, heard of that. Uh, inventory in motion is obviously all the inventory that's uh, stuck, you know, or uh, in transit or uh, making their way to your warehouses or your distribution centers. Typically, it's on a truck, it's on a ship and whatnot. Um, and that's uh, usually pretty hard to track because there's so many moving parts and, uh, and, and engagement with the 3PLs, if you're using that, supply chain organizations are going to be super important. But then inventory at rest is not a luxury. That's something all of uh, if any product seller need to have a pretty good handle on. What is that? Inventory at rest is basically the inventory that's in your warehouse, that's in the distribution center, that's in your retail stores, right? And uh, it's important that you you know know what's uh, the visibility into this inventory so you can manage uh, your forecasting, you can manage your sales campaigns, you can manage how much you can fulfill from a retailer demand standpoint, particularly with products that have seasonality and have uh, 
uh, you know, um, um, uh, probably eye volume transaction coming in because of the holiday season and so on, understanding what do you have and what you might have based on the inventory in transit is going to be super important so you can plan your organization growth appropriately. Um, the who, when it comes to inventory, it's obviously starts with you as a product seller, right? So in this case, uh, Tim's organization, which is uh, the Good Crisp, Crisp company, they are the number uh, one uh, stakeholder in this mix. Second is your suppliers, right? Uh, I mean, common sense, right? Obviously, you need to have a good engagement and uh, integration from a system standpoint. So you have the ability to understand uh, what's coming from your suppliers who are dependent and understanding also supplier performance over the years. Uh, your retailers, companies that, uh, you know, retail uh, locations, whether it's big or small, uh, that might be carrying your products, right? And uh, what type of relationship you have, what type of engagement that you have with them. Uh, shipping companies, that's actually broadly logistics, right? Uh, as a whole, uh, how do you engage with them? Uh, and then last but not least, your customers. Uh, all of these are actors that you need to factor in when you think about having a good 360 view on how your inventory is performing. And then when you think about the when, um, it's uh, this this is kind of a bit of a science and an art, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, planning the amount of inventory you need to have, and then forecasting based on the demand, both on the supply side and the sales side, um, you're obviously going to factor in some of the market forces. You know whether it's uh, a, a perceived a social campaign or a social campaign that you're running and uh, the expected growth out of that or a, or a spike, if you will, or a competitive threat or a pressure um, or any new products that you might be launching. You know, as you were coming on the call, Daniel was just talking about, uh, you know, a new product that uh, Tim's company launched and how that's doing well. You got to think about the behavior of new product very differently than an existing product. Because a lot of times the cost of bringing a new product early on is super high, uh, and you have to learn and you have to prepare and have some bandwidth set aside for that um, while you, uh, you know, continue to grow your existing SKUs as well. Uh, and then the last piece is super important because you don't want all of your capital be stuck on uh, ingredients or raw materials or work in process goods. So you got to think about like, how do you balance how much you order, whether you are a manufacturer or a pure distributor, either way how much you need to have, like going back to the comment I made about inventory um, um, on hand, you got to be able to uh, have a good handle on that. Otherwise, you're going to end up spending a lot of money stuck in it, restricting your growth overall. And I'll share a couple of examples of how companies tend to struggle with it without having a good visibility into uh, the status of their inventory. Where? We touched on this briefly, right? This is where the uh, inventory in motion, inventory at rest comes into play. Uh, having a good visibility into how much you have in your warehouse or garage. Um, it's okay when you're growing up and early on to keep all of this in mind and you know exactly it's in the back shelf on the third uh, bin, but at some point in time, you're going to grow out of it. When you grow out of it, uh, you want to have a, you, you want to have a system that's going to be super helpful for us to know this uh, data. Um, and uh, so you can plan um, your organizational forecast and growth appropriately. Um, the second location is suppliers, right? Um, again, this is not just about understanding uh, where uh, the, the, the inventory that you are expecting to receive ingredients, raw materials, or finished goods that you're going to take in and distribute. It's also the quality of the supplier and the performance of their supplier over the course, whatever the relationship that you've had with them. How do you use that to factor in as you're thinking about replenishment going forward? Three PLs, uh, third-party logistics. Uh, many of our customers, and I'm sure many of you are using some of the three PL facility, or some of you might have your own warehouses. Uh, it's important to have that relationship with the three PL, understand where things are. I have seen organizations single-handedly uh, struggle to make because of their uh, broken relationship with the three PL. So really important, not just to uh, pick the right three PL, but also have an ongoing discussion and engagement with them. So you're super clear with your expectations and prioritization and understand that the capacity on the 3PL side is also there to match your demand. The last thing obviously is the retail stores, especially if you're using it as a retail uh, business. And then, uh, you know, obviously uh, anything that's online, physical, you know, whatever, you got to be able to have a good handle on 
um, how that's playing out from a, a demand perspective. So all of this, like, you know, the what, the who, the why, the when, at the end of the day, like, why does it all matter, right? Um, as a growing emerging business, at the end of the day, you know, we want to be able to run not just an efficient organization, but an organization that can continue to grow. And later today, Tim will talk about some of this journey that they've gone through, having gone through a significant growth. Um, it starts with being uh, super smart about uh, how we are managing costs, right? Uh, we talk about this as controlling costs, but it's uh, it's all about like managing the cost that's going in. Like I said earlier, when you are introducing new SKUs, your cost equation is going to look very different than you continuing to operate on an existing SKU. And uh, especially organizations that have like a large number of SKUs, um, I don't know enough about your businesses to comment, but I've seen customers that have 80, 100 SKUs and I've, we've dealt with a customer not too long ago that have 80,000 SKUs, believe it or not, right? And that is super important. And your cost equation is going to be super different based on that. So some thinking around it rather than being very reactive, some proactive planning around how I think about my SKU architecture and structure is going to be super important from a longer term efficiency and growth. Um, improving customer satisfaction. This is true for any business, right? It's not just for product sellers. Any business at the end of the day, you got to keep an eye on the customers and the customer engagement. And the, you know, one of the common things you can track about is like repeat business and the uh, total customer value. Uh, if a customer is buying product A from you, what would it take for them to continue to product buy product A? The whole subscription aspect in CPG has been on, on fire over the last couple of years. If uh, some of you haven't explored that, uh, something I would strongly recommend you look into, especially for some uh, some products. It's actually a, a really, really good model to get uh, uh, higher customer retention, but also repeat purchase. Um, and then expanding your market, right? Whether it's uh, new SKUs like we talked about or new geographies or new channel. Um, getting into new channel is not easy, um, even though it might be tempting to say, if I just opened up blah, connect with Amazon or connect with Walmart, uh, that I could double my revenue. But honestly, uh, what you put in is what you get out, right? So you got to be super thoughtful of why you are looking to expand into a particular market or a particular channel. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, why this all matters is at the end of the day, how you're performing against the market, right? You know, very rarely we uh, tend to operate in a business where there's no competition. Um, if you are, uh, power to you. Uh, and, uh, uh, and probably if you are right now, it's a very temporary state. We have seen this time and time again in any product category. Uh, and you got to be uh, moving the ball, right? It's almost like, how do I invest in my product quality, customer engagement, profitability? So you're always like, you know, uh, a step or two ahead of where the market is. So, you you know, they can not catch you, if you will. Okay. So that's just so a quick landscape when you think about inventory as a whole. Daniel? Uh, Joy, yeah, maybe uh, just let me, I, I would love to try to summarize the slide because there's a lot of good info here, but just to catch people up. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding then, so inventory management overall is all about like, okay, there's a lot of stuff you have to think about from your, for your product, like the raw materials that go into it, the amount of finished product that you have. And like, where is that finished product also? Do you just have one warehouse or do you have multiple warehouses? Do you have three PLs that the product's sitting in? Do you have, you know, distributors where the product is? Um, and just kind of taking into account all of these, um, sorry, Tim, I'm just gonna mute your audio there. Um, and um, just trying to understand all of these different arenas so that when somebody says like, hey, we've got this new customer, can we fulfill it? you actually know the answer to that because you understand like, okay, here's how much inventory I have at these different locations. What's that going to mean? If I need to do another run quickly, do I even have all the ingredients that I need for that? Um, so would you, are those some of the, are those, is that a good summary or did, did I miss anything really critical? Uh, I, th I think you, you summarized. I mean, you definitely speak like someone that you've been in this business before. Uh, so that's fantastic. Now, at the end of the day, right? I mean, the simplest way to talk about the inventory is like, do you have a view on what comes in the door? And you have a view on what goes out the door and what happens in between those two endpoints, right? Point A and point B. And the more you have control and visibility into that journey, the more efficient you're going to be, more opportunities you are going to expand and grow, right? That's what's in a nutshell. But it's important for you to think about in this context. The reason even Stephen you know, put together the slide, the reason it's important is sometimes people get uh, blindsided by one or the other, right? You get blindsided by your supplier. You get blindsided by your 3PL. 
that's where usually you end up in uh, in a challenging environment. That's where it's important you keep aware. It's almost like a control dashboard, right? You want to know everything that's going on, uh, not just have a you know very selective channel uh, view on one particular party. Um, and and you don't want to do this all alone, right? I think one of the main things for us, especially in this day and age with a lot of innovation and uh, uh, capabilities out there, um, many of this, again, some of the concepts we were talking about are super simple, uh, like tracking inventory. It, it's like, you know, I had five come in, I sold three, I've got two left. Come on, how hard can it be, right? Simple math. But some of them can get pretty tricky, especially when you have dependencies with your suppliers coming in and you're actually doing manufacturing you have to commit a delivery date and it's let's say it's a you know um uh, for a particular season that's coming up and you need to get this out on a on a set time how do you start planning how do you start uh, throwing more resources at certain things right and uh, are you making the right call one of the things that we talk to our customers all the time is like when you do inventory replenishment do you know which one to replenish right are you picking the right skew from a profitability standpoint so there are obviously things that are super sophisticated and complicated. That's where tools are super, you know, a friend of yours, right? Think about the right set of tools, not suggesting all of you drop whatever you have and go uh, get to X, Y, or Z, but take advantage of what's out there from a capability standpoint. What we have seen customers use, when I ask, we manage our inventory, great, but then they say, oh, we use spreadsheets. Spreadsheets is not bad, right? I mean, spreadsheets and Google Sheets, uh, probably great tools for many, many, many things. But for inventory management at a certain level, yes, you're emerging, you have one product, one SKU, one channel. Sure. You, can you track them in your uh, sheets? Absolutely. But once you get to a point where you have multiple of those parties involved, you have a 3PL, you have a couple of different suppliers, and specifically you have more than one channel. What do I mean by that? Um, you have an, um, a Shopify store that you have set up or a WooCommerce store or whatnot. Now you're looking at expanding into Amazon. The moment you add the second channel or vice versa, you started off on Amazon and you're like, nah, I want to actually set up my own brand, own store. The moment you turn that on, um, yeah, get time to get off of spreadsheet, okay? There is no uh, better way to say it. You, you have to have a better control because tracking orders coming in across multiple channels, I got 1,000 orders from Amazon, 1,000 orders from Shopify and trying to reconcile all of that um, using an Excel sheet is not a good idea. We would not, uh, uh, you know, recommend that. Um, the reason being, right? You know, this is obviously a you know a good marketing slide, but we have seen this time and time again with customers, right? If you do not adopt some of the new inventory management practices, you are guaranteeing failure, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. There's no sugarcoating that statement. How you get to success? Obviously, there is a path to it. Where you invest and where you drive efficiency, it obviously depends on your organization's maturity, process pain points, people involved, types of products you sell, et cetera. The pattern that we have seen, this is not just a, a, you know, this is a summary of some of the experience that we have heard from a lot of our customers. Key thing is obviously for us, you know, and we have, we have data on companies that actually have gone flat from a growth perspective and eventually don't exist. So growth is important, you know, for you to continue to thrive and survive. And if you want to fuel growth, you got to be able to move and manage the inventory, right? The more turnover that happens, the better you are, the more profitable you get, et cetera. If you want to have that type of movement and motion from an inventory standpoint, you have to be prepared to handle complexity, which is what I was talking about. Some of them is simple math, not a lot of them, right? We need to be able to handle that complexity and don't try to do it alone. What we have seen, this is just one illustration of a data point, right? This is from a, a, one of the recent study um, I think it was done by Intuit with the small businesses. Uh, one of the things it talks about is the amount of inventory waste that happens over the year. This is a global number, I believe. $160 billion worth of inventory, right? And uh, and if they look at, peel the onion, look at what's going on. What is inventory waste? It could be in many different forms. It's like SKUs you carry that's past the expiration date, SKUs that you carry that does, doesn't have any more uh, relevance in the market, out of fashion, you know, whatever the case may be. There are many different ways uh, that you that you can run into inventory waste. It's not just finished products. It's also ingredients, the 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 bundle products that I talked about. So you need to be super thoughtful on this. And and when they peel the onion and look at the statistics, two thirds of customers that they uh, talk to are using spreadsheets. Again, uh, I don't have to sell that point any order. Uh, it is impossible. We have seen time and time again 
And I'm sure Daniel can uh, quote some personal examples of what he has seen in the industry. I'm sure Tim can talk through some of that as well. So the second it's thing too, that we- It's oh. too, pain, too painful to remember some of the waste <laughs> <laughs> that, we, that we've had. So, but uh, yes, yes, it's there. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't want to trigger any uh, scary memories for you, Daniel. Um, but no, but again, one example is like we had an outdoor company, right? That I had a chance to talk to. They were a family-owned business. They've been around for business for like decades. And then when COVID hit, obviously they have to scramble and shut everything down and not, all not all that. But then what happened was one of the things that happened with the COVID was people are actually getting outdoors more. They're all out there. I mean, in fact, our family we picked up paddle boarding during COVID. And that's what happened. And a lot of people were like, yeah, we need paddle boards and this board and that. And uh, these guys were literally put on notice to move from the spreadsheets and whatnot into a, a inventory management system. So sometimes you get those wake up calls and you have to go run through them in a very fast pace, try to get the uh, system up and running so you can capitalize on the demand. In some cases, you won't even have that opportunity. By the time you realize it, it might be too late. So this is one of those things where prevention is better than cure, right? Yeah. So you got to plan ahead, especially for growing organizations. Think about this as an investment you're putting in to secure future growth. The second, I say, that, oh, I was yeah. just going to add, like some of the pain points that we really saw. You mentioned about um, having a good relationship with your three PL or your warehouse was, I mean, just even getting an accurate count of inventory from the warehouse, and then also really getting an accurate count of how much ingredients were, how much of the ingredients were being used by. Um, the co-man also. So I, I know this stuff can really help with that. But without that, I mean, yeah, we ended up with just lots of problems and not being able to fulfill orders that we thought we could. So just e echoing your point. Awesome. Well, thank you. Now, the second challenge that we see, uh, one is obviously uh, not having to, you know, uh, a spreadsheet obviously will help. The second thing is operating in silos. Uh, what do I mean by that? Right. This is where, again, as you're growing, you're going to have certain disciplines within the organization the back office from an accounting standpoint. You got to have a good view on how much money is coming in, how much money is going out. What does the profitability look like? Um, you have your own shipping, right? You know, at the end of the day, uh, whatever product we have, our success is not keeping the product in the warehouse. Our success is getting the product out of the warehouse in the hands of the customers as fast as you can. So there's obviously shipping um, uh, plays a big role. And then all of your channels, right? You know, like I talked about uh, Shopify and Amazon, it's WooCommerce, it's, uh, you know, whatever platform that you use, it's eBay, it's Walmart, it's, you know, other specialized uh, marketplaces that are picking up momentum. Some of them are very uh, uh, popular in certain geographies that you need to keep an eye on, right? So it's super important that you don't try to come up with a system or an implementation where you are only focused on tracking inventory. Right. So one of the examples that I use is like customers trying to tackle inventory in, in silos might as well not do it, because at the end of the day, this is about an integrated operation. And that requires visibility across all of those players from the point of receiving goods to point of selling and everything that goes in between. And then having connections into your accounting system, whether it's cookbooks online or zero or something else that you're using, making sure those integrations are in place so you can track this all the way. Same thing with our EDI 3PL. Like if you have a, a training partner in you know, a large retailers, you know, Daniel talked about the importance of relationship with 3PL. Getting to know them, having that human connection, it's super important. But even more important is making sure that your EDI 3PL connections are set right and validated so you got the right set of orders and you can fulfill with confidence. Okay, so I'll wrap up this by talking to you about five things you need to know. We're trying to come up with some fun way of doing this. I was trying to be a David Letterman and start throwing cards and stuff. Uh, maybe next time we'll do that. But uh, we'll thought we'll just uh, give you a sense because we've been talking about inventory, inventory, inventory. But it's not just about inventory, guys. Like when we think about inventory management, it's almost like, uh, you know, uh, it, it's the core, uh, obviously, of your business. So that's why the focus is on it. But it's beyond that. The, I talked about the EDI connection, uh, EDI 3PL connection to your, re you know, your retailers and your 3PLs. Super important for you to focus on, especially those of you that actually rely on this. Um, super important you get this right. Second is the e-commerce marketplaces. I cannot understate the importance of how well connected it needs to be. So you have a good reflection of what's the stock and end. Like stock levels getting misreported is probably the biggest reason you have customer dissatisfaction and loss of profit. 
right? Either you underrepresent your stock level or you overrepresent your stock level. Either is bad thing. If you oversold, your customers are unhappy. If you're undersold, you must be unhappy, right? So just keep uh, keep an eye on how much integration, uh, how much value these integrations can drive, especially when you look to expand to multiple marketplaces. Uh, third is automation. Uh, one of the things that we have seen, um, you know, Daniel talked about some, you know, uh, scary memories from the past of doing a lot of things manually. One of the things you also want to look into is like how much of the process you can automate, whether it's a sales order approval, whether it's fulfillment, whether it's replenishment. Um, yes, I, mean, I remember talking to a customer not too long ago where she doesn't matter where, uh, which part of the world she is in, whether she's working or on vacation, her team members always call her to place a replenishment order. Okay, um, it, it works fine uh, when you're a small business, when you're running, uh, 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 you know, sub million dollar, two million dollars. But once you scale, once you start operating in these multiple channels, that could be a difference between a 20 percent growth and a zero percent growth. Right. So think about that. Like, how can you enable your employees to make those decisions with confidence? That's the super important part. It's not just automating everything and say, approve all the sales orders. But what are the thresholds you can set aside? Set aside. What are the conditions you can have from an inventory replenishment order, where the the team member doesn't have to rely on one person in the organization to have that information in their uh, head that they have to review and approve everything. And then there's lots of mundane tasks that we can eliminate from an inventory management, sales order fulfillment, etc. That could be automated to save a lot of time for for you and your team members. The fourth is data and insights. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one. There's so much excitement and hype around machine learning and AI. If you haven't heard that, uh, I'm you know I'll be I'll be stunned. Um, but for us, I mean, if you take the hype away of all of the, uh, the the noise, there is some real applicability. How we think about taking some of the data that we have and understand about the customer journey and behavior. How do we turn them into insights? We are doing something in our platform. Many companies out there are doing something in their platform. This is about, you know, going back to my comment about automation, how do we help users make decisions confidently? That's what it comes down to at the end of the day. I remember asking this question to a customer about a year ago, right? Or nine months ago. Like, how do you decide which supplier to use, right? Especially when you're on a crunch. And you go, um, we've always used this one. Uh, and I said, what about the other two? Uh, I don't know, man. This one uh, tend to be uh, always right. And we looked at the data. Actually, it was not the case, right? So how do you make sure we provide some uh, you know, intelligence on what the supplier performance looks like in terms of delivering on time, delivering on budget, uh, delivering quality products to you and so on? Same thing around uh, uh, forecasting. We talked about forecasting and planning in the inventory slide. How can we get smarter about when do you need to start applying your forecast model especially to the comment that Daniel made earlier, which is around if you're dependent on a manufacturing process, process to get stuff produced so you can actually uh, uh, stock up your shelves or your retailer shelves, what point in time there is a long lead cycle. I remember reading about the logistics. I mean, we've all seen the supply chain challenge kind of go, go through a pretty crazy ride over the last several few years. The average time from a port in China to US is now I think it's about 40 days. It used to be, what, 85, 90 days, right, during uh, the peak of uh, post-pandemic. How do you anticipate for a lot, lot of that? If you're waiting on a 50-day uh, availability for your holiday campaign, and then you place the order, you feel really good about the forecast, but then the, the ship won't make it uh, on the shore until 90 days, I mean, you know, you missed the boat, pun intended there. So I think that's a super important thing. When do you, you know, how do you use data to assist you in your job and turn them into actionable insights? The last piece is how do you uh, bring a lot of these capabilities together with a tighter integration? Um, I cannot overstate the importance of this. This goes back to my silo comment I made earlier. Having knowledge about the inventory is important, but also having the knowledge about all of the different parties that plays around. That's why I spend some time thinking about who are the parties that you need to keep in mind from TPL to suppliers, to customers, to retailers, to EDI, you know, trading merchants, all of them need to be super integrated. One such integration that, uh, that is, you know, we have seen our customers benefit a lot from that's uh, super critical is our integration into accounting, right? And uh, any inventory management system should have a pretty solid seamless integration with data flowing back and forth between QuickBooks or Xero at the end of the day, if, you not, if you're not on top of the numbers, 
you're not on top of your business. It's as simple as that. So you got to be able to know how much money is company, uh, coming in, how much money is going out, what's the delay, what's your accounts receivable look like, what's your DSO, all of that needs to be available so you can run your business better. A person that can actually talk about this in a very, very knowledgeable fashion is uh, our guest today, uh, Tim. Tim actually runs finance in the Good Crisp company. So I want to bring him in, but before uh, Joey, I do, uh, yeah, I just had a, can you go back to the last slide just for a yeah. second? I just want to get, get some questions on this one. So sure. a couple of questions about, I think integrations, like, so would, you know, Sin7 typically would integrate with Shopify, like WooCommerce, all of that stuff. Yeah, so uh, from an integration standpoint, like, yeah, we have over 900 integrations from a Sin7 perspective. Uh, we connect with all of the marketplace sites, like all of the e-commerce platform, so to speak, right? Shopify, WooCommerce, Magento. Um, um, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting a, a ton of them. Uh, Wayfair, eBay, I mean, you name it. We've got a bunch of those marketplaces and commerce platforms that we connect with. That's one aspect, right? The second aspect is shipping. All of the shipping providers, right? You know, whether it's uh, you're using ShipStation or ShipRush, um, you know, you need to have that integration as well. The third is CRM tools. Like you might be using different marketing tools, different CRM tools. Uh, you need that integration as well. Um, accounting that I talked about, which is uh, QuickBooks or Zero, right? You know, you need that connections as well. And then the last piece on that puzzle is all the EDI 3PL connections. Okay, got it. Um, and then just kind of a journey question here. Let's say like, you know, you start your own brand or just you're starting from zero here. You get to the point where you have a formula, you know, let's say you're making a drink or something that has 10 ingredients in it. Let's say if you don't have this kind of a system, what's probably going to happen to you for inventory management as you like, so you're at the point where you've locked your formula and you have a comb in, you need to figure out, you need to start like ordering it. You need to, you know, get a forecast to your comb in and start producing that and then start understanding what your, you know, typical customer forecast is going to look like. What, what do you think people are going to be doing if they don't have a you know, full-fledged system or whatever in the, in the meantime? And what are some tips for people as they're doing it to at least make the most of it before they move over to an inventory management software? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you this uh, very uh, obvious answer, which is it depends, right? <laughs> but in reality, what happens is like people actually overcompensate for lack of tooling, right? That's what happens. That's why businesses run... You know, we've seen companies actually uh, come to us uh, with a lot of pain when they don't have tool sets in place, but they have a lot of manual processes, people working like superheroes, try to go from where they are to what they need to get done. But at the end of the day, what happens is that your uh, potential is compromised, right? If you do not have the tool, and I'm not saying it's in seven, like go look at uh, whatever platform that you think uh, either it's, it's good for your organization. But you need to invest in a tool that allows you to get to your maximum potential. If you don't do that, then you know whatever growth you're seeing. If you're growing at ten percent, you might be you know growing at forty percent. If you had all of those processes automated and connected, that's the biggest thing. It's the opportunity cost number one. Number two is like the the, the data point that I shared around the inventory waste. You don't realize when you realize it, it's literally too late for you for many organizations. Your cost, uh, you know, your cash flow tight, and you become dependent on other lenders and so on, and you literally go out of business. We have seen customer stories after customer stories of companies that struggle to make that transition. That's why I made the comment what I made, which is like prevention is better than cure. Um, of course, companies react and and catch up on this at the last minute, but you want to plan ahead. And again, I'm sure Tim can talk to it because Good Crisp Company actually went through a pretty significant growth, probably 10x in the last few years. And if I if I do my math right, they're expecting about 40, 50% growth this year as well. Some of this came up. I mean, Tim obviously joined by the time they've already chosen Sin7 Core. And that takes time, right? A tool is not a magic solution. It's not a silver bullet, guys, right? When you pick a tool, you also have to adapt your process. Sometimes you have to relearn some of the processes because you might be doing it a certain way that may or may not work well. So some of them you have to leave behind. Some of them you have to learn based on the platform of choice. And that takes time. You know, it's not a, as much as that I want to say, and I'm sure uh, my sales and marketing would love for me to say this, saying it's all seamless, guys. Flip a switch and everything is business as usual. It's not. It takes a level of planning and thoughtful uh, engagement. And that's why you got to do that when you can afford to, yep. not when you're killing yourself. Okay, so, but tell me if this journey is right. For somebody who doesn't have this software, like they're starting with, let's say a formula that has their ingredient breakdown, you know, weight by gram or whatever for each ingredient. 
And then they're probably thinking like, okay, let me, here's the sample quantity we're going to order from the manufacturer. Okay. Multiplied by my ingredient breakdown. Here's the total amount they need. Oh, did we lose uh, Daniel? Thinking like, oh, okay, well, this amount's going to go to this where back up against their original formula to project out the ingredients and then understand, you know, where they're going to end up shipping it, right, as well. And like, what are, are there any other, and like, you know, obviously looking at their e-commerce orders and trying to true all of that up inside of the spreadsheet. Am I like hitting on a lot of the complexity that someone would have to build into like a homegrown spreadsheet? Yeah, in a, in a co-man type situation, those are the complexities. In other cases, it's just your sourcing products and your distributor. It's a little different, right? You're not worried about the formula and the complexity of the ingredients and so on. You just want to get the product in, in your warehouse in the right time. So you can either create your own bundle or you're just reselling either way, right? There, it's a li little less complicated on the inbound, but it's equally complicated on the outbound, right? especially when you think about the forecasting, like how much uh, stock level I need to set aside for Shopify, how much I need to set aside for Amazon, whatever other channels, like you might have a retail uh, partnerships. Those are the stuff that actually really breaks you because you cannot literally manage them in a manual way. People do it, like I said, people have used manual processes where you overcompensate by throwing people at the problem, but you're losing a lot of efficiency by doing that. In, in some cases, like I said, in many cases, it comes down to, What's the potential for the business to grow and how much this beca this is becoming an inhibitor? Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, let's bring on Tim. All right, Tim. Hopefully, I heard, I saw you nodding a few times along the way. So hopefully this is all making <laughs> sense. Yeah, some um, things that brought back interesting memories and all. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and I think, you know, it, 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 it even goes beyond the fact, you know, Danny, you were mentioning, okay, so, you know, I have my recipe, et cetera. And, and, you know, so many companies start up, you know, it's in, in their kitchen and they have this idea and they start putting things together and say, well, I know I need, you know, this many grams or this many ounces of this, this and this. And they're very careful about doing that. And then they suddenly realize when someone else is doing that, you start having waste. And that waste can grow so quickly and you start wondering, well, I bought enough of everything for 20,000, uh, you know, barrels of this or that. And how come I only got 10, you know, 10,000 barrels out of it? And so that's when, you know, again, where spreadsheets will break down because, it, uh, you know, they, they just don't scale with, with production, waste, et cetera. Anyway, uh, yeah, in interesting conversation. Ajoy, just, he just hit on so many things that, that I have been a part of at a variety of different companies, even when it was not CPG. Uh, you know, we had those troubles in the automobile business, in the motorcycle business, in the sporting goods business. So it's not just limited to here, uh, uh, but uh, a little bit about Good Chris. So our company was, was started by uh, our founder in 2013 uh, in Australia. And he quickly realized that if he really wants to be making you know, a name uh, for, for the company that he was gonna need to move things and uh, initially moved it into California uh, and then on into Boulder, Colorado in 2016 with, with three people. Uh, in 2021, uh, we, uh, we added uh, cheese balls to our uh, product line. We were just a canister chip company prior to that. And uh, we moved up to five people. Um, and, and this year we've added uh, bagged chips or the, what we call the crinkle cut. Um, and we are now up to 20 people. Uh, our growth has been tremendous. We've had huge success with a lot of, of different retailers and distribu distribution channels. Uh, it's been a great ride and, and we don't see that that is slowing down. And um, you know, inventory management plays just such a huge role in, in our success. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, that we you know, have to keep a very focused uh, on is, you know, I, I keep, you know, banging, banging into my fist, landed cost, landed cost, landed cost, uh, because there's more to it than just the ingredients. I've got freight that comes in, I've got customs that come in, I've got, uh, you know, the, the various warehouse handling and debanning, et cetera. And all, you know, looking at all those costs that go into putting a product on the warehouse shelf ready to sell. And that is a very important piece for, so I can now understand what is my true margin. 
Once I get to the point where I need to pick, pack, ship, uh, well, those are part of the sales general administrative costs that are not part of COGS. Uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've been with a variety of companies where we were purchasing other brands and looking at their business and the number of folks that would come in and, and say that how, you know, how their margins were, et cetera. And, and then you realize over time, they're not including their own labor time. They're not including any freight in, they're not including any warehousing costs, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly realizing, well, actually your product is a very, very low margin um, that, you know, something that just needs to be worked on, not, you know, unresolvable. So, uh, you know, extremely important. And then, you know, inventory valuation. Uh, how much money have I got tied up uh, of my assets in inventory? Um, super important, you know, with regards to, you know, you're, you're an emerging company. Odds are you, you may be wanting to look at funding. Folks will look very, very closely at your inventory uh, for any asset backed lending or your, your uh, investors want to know how, how are you turning your inventory? Um, you know, we will, we turn inventory at a variety of companies. I've been with anywhere from four times a year to 12 times a year, you know, and, and remembering that every time I'm selling inventory, I've got more cash to go begin buying more inventory. So I only have to lay out that cash, you know, a couple of times a year, not every time I go out to, to buy it because I'm you know, hopefully I've got a margin there to, to apply toward my purchases. And month end reconciliations with our three PLs, uh, you know, super critical, something that you know, it's very difficult to do without some sort of, of uh, assistance through a program, you know, with or some of, some of the others, excuse me, since seven. So, uh, you know, so what does it mean? Um, it gives us the data for us to be able to make real decisions, tough decisions about, well, do we need to start considering a second or third supplier? Do we need to look at other uh, lines of transportation, getting product out the door or in the door uh, so that we can get our costs to where they need to be, or our, our profits where they need to be? Um, you know, looking, as I mentioned before, evaluating, well, who's going to give us some of the best lending with regards to, uh, you know, they all will take inventory into consideration as to what, what you're worth for giving you, uh, you, you a loan or so. And so those are just, you know, Super important pieces that inventory just plays. I mean, it, 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 it is, as I always said, it's kind of the central piece of, of so much that happens at the company. Um, and you've got to get a good control over that. Um, and and it's just super critical, especially, you know, when you start experiencing hyper growth, uh, too challenging to, to try and do that, you know, by, by hand, obviously. You know, I remember in the, the early days, my early days at, uh, uh, I was overseas in the automobile business. I used to walk around with a spiral bound book and that's how I knew where everything was um, because it was that or carrying around a four inch stack of folded computer printout paper because we didn't have these kinds of tools. So um, yeah, and, then, and, you know, and getting that data uh, about you know our inventory and being able to, to to look at days sales outstanding and days inventory outstanding, uh, my um, uh, cash conversion cycle, uh, etc. Uh, so I can see well how are we doing? Where do I start to see that we can make improvements um, in our cash flow, uh, in our management and control of inventory? Um, yeah, and one of the things very very important. You know, with a tool like um, Sin Seven, is is building the uh, the recipes, so to speak. So you know, okay, here's my forecast of how much I should be using of different ingredients, and I can, with that all flowing right into the the uh, financials, I can see at the end of the month when I make my inventory count, uh, why are we using more salt than than I expected? We should have had ten thousand pounds. Why do we only have five thousand pounds? Are, did we waste it? Did somebody drop it? Did we lose it? Um, all you know, very important pieces of that that I, I couldn't stress more uh, that you all need to just keep an eye on. Yeah. Hey, su super helpful uh, information there, Tim. Hey, one thing you can comment on, especially given a lot of the attendees here uh, are probably going through some of that growth spurt, like as you guys have experienced, I guess, I guess four or five years ago and continue to have a strong trajectory. What are some of your lessons learned? I know you came in when the core was already in place. 
But how do you think about a tooling? I mean, I said it from a product perspective, more of a bit of a view from a, uh, you know, how we think about product investment based on customer pains and so on. Share your perspective. Like what, I know you talked about some of the ability to track cost and whatnot. Just anything else you would highlight in terms of the value that they derived from a platform and specifically around the integration I talked about, specifically the accounting and inventory, right? I, I don't think it can be overstated, like I said earlier. Anything you want to comment on that, like how it makes, I mean, you made a comment about the landed cost and the importance of having that number, right? From overall profitability. Anything you want to add to that, Tim? Yeah, you know, that, quite honestly, that, that landed cost piece is, is, is such a huge uh, focus point uh, for for us and for every company I've been in because everybody everybody wants to know what's our real margin. You know, I, am I ever really getting getting this information accurately? Uh, and, and you know, it it's I mean there are a lot of pieces of this that are super important, but landed costs couldn't be uh, any more important. You know, for for us uh, and with all all the companies that I've, I've worked with uh, that use an inventory valuation system. Certainly, you know, it's about product inventory, uh, raw materials usage uh, that is extremely important. Um, and, and, but, um, you know, yeah, landed costs is, is super critical. Um, and, and I know that, that uh, well, one of the things that I'll mention, uh, that Joy had said regarding, you've got to take the time uh, to learn whatever system you choose. Um, there, there's some great documentation uh, in in the Deer uh, Sin Seven system that uh, talks directly about landed costs, um, and yeah, I had to spend lots and lots of time uh, learning the system. Uh, you, you can't expect to just jump in and say, "Oh, it, it, it's just going to be super easy." It, take, it takes a concerted effort and, and an interest in it. Um, so, so, Joy, before you jump in that demo, can you, you want to cover the last slide real quick in case people yeah. want to? You know, get a trial or no, again. I'm I'm not going to spend uh, more than thirty seconds here because I do have one more question I want to ask Tim, and then I'll do the last slide, guys. Given we're talking about so much on the product, so this is essentially the the landing dashboard from an you know um, Sin Seven Core standpoint. In you have dashboard, you can personalize the dashboard. But what I want to just show you is like the capabilities we've been talking about all along. You know, across from a core perspective, you know, all of the purchasing you can track. You can set up simple purchases. You can look for all the different purchases and suppliers in here. Um, and, and uh, you know, um, and then you track all of your sales, similar approach, like the behavior is super consistent across the product, um, you know, setting up a simple sale, advanced sale, um, you know, RMA, which is a you know, pretty sophisticated capability, a lot of our customers appreciate. Uh, so you can have the full 360 view from a returns management perspective. Uh, we have a full production module. So for those of you that actually do assembly, disassembly, you can do that but you can also do full discrete or process manufacturing. We have a lot of beverage companies that do continuous production and we have capabilities to do that, but also track um, you know, the serial lot numbers so we can be super, super uh, good with the batch numbers and so on and have that life cycle completely tracked. Um, some of the things that I highlighted here, again, I'm not going to go through and click on, um, you'll see some of the connections into the financials, basic CRM, so you can track your contacts bunch of reports out of the box. I think the last count is about 75 or so reports across. Somebody asked the question on like what we do to help with the new SKU. Specifically launch of new SKU, you obviously have to do a lot of research outside the box. But in terms of understanding, if you're uh, launching something as a peripheral adjacent product, you can look at inventory stock level, you can look at aging, you can look at profitability, and then try to do some modeling on, on a new SKU that you would bring. Maybe I don't know, Tim. You have some comments on that around when we, when you, when you thought about the new Crinkle uh, product. How, what type of insights and data you captured from Core to make that decision uh, from a product uh, launch as well as from a pricing standpoint? Maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, is is interesting. So we we actually we co-man some of our products and we um, uh, you know produce, produce others you know. Uh, fully built for us, right? Um, and our most recent product, the, the Crinkle Cut, we are, we are co-man uh, here in the US. And, and the tool really helped uh, allow us to begin to you know, build out, you know, what are our needs going to be from a, a raw materials perspective, um, building in uh, 
delivery timeframes, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it, it was, it's super critical to, to get down into, you know, the weeds, um, you know, initially to look at, all right, well, again, when do we need to be having product? When is our retailer expecting to have that delivered? Um, and what are, what are the potential hangups that, that we're going to see, whether it's in just manufacturing because a new product, you know, it's going to take some time. There are going to be some hiccups. Um, and uh, uh, to try and use the tool the best we can to, to address those issues. Got it. Okay, super. I know we're coming up on time. I wanted to quickly show you the last slide. Um, as Daniel said earlier, right? Go, please visit this page. Um, you can sign up for a free trial, which is about 14 days long. And uh, there's also a special offer for startup CPG members as part of this webinar. You get 50% off for the first three months of Sin7 Core. Uh, please do check this out and email um, you know, marketing at sin7.com if you have other questions. I know there's a bunch of questions posted. Some of them we covered in the uh, live conversation. There was two questions that I did not. One is around the logistics company integration. Everybody using a different platform. That is so true. Um, but we have many, many, many integrations, right? Like I said, there's about 900 integrations. Some of them are uh, 3PL connections and so on. So very likely, whatever your 3PL partner, you know, there is a uh, integration or we have partners that actually offer connections or build connections to those 3PLs as well. And then on the data, somebody asked the question, if you have to manually enter it, not really. Like if you're looking at a product data, you can either import them in into from an Excel sheet into core or you connect core into one of your marketplaces and bring the product down. Like you can set it up into Shopify if you have an existing Shopify store and bring the product information so you can get started uh, pretty quickly and start using the product in a matter of days, um, uh, if you will. Okay. Joy, what's the yeah. um what what's yeah. what what is the general pricing, by the way, just so people know what what is 50%? Yeah, the starting, yeah, we have three different SKUs, obviously, with a lot of flexibility around the modules and, and uh, levels based on their consumption. But the starting price on Sin7 Core is uh, $349 a month. Okay, cool. So nice little discount if you sign up through Startup CPG. Um, yeah, I just want to thank all of you guys for taking the time to go through us through through this with us. This is a this is a complicated topic. It's not one you learn about when you watch Shark Tank, but this is actually <laughs> this is what it's really like to start and run uh, a company. And so, I, I, yeah, thank you guys for taking the time. And again, I just I, I really you know give my kind of you know full hearted support to Sin Seven because just overwhelmingly they have been recommended by people in our community. Um, by the consultants who you know know what the stuff that's most effective and easiest to work with is. So we're really happy to finally be able to partner with them to make it a little bit more accessible to people from the community um, and just looking forward to a really long productive relationship with you guys. So definitely I put the link also in the chat if you want to get a um, demo or free trial for Sin7, you can click on it there. Um, or, I mean, Sin7 is really responsive if you want to email them at marketing and just kind of have a more direct chat with them there. And we will post this recording on our Vimeo and also a new YouTube that we're starting. Uh, gotta be gotta be cool with the kids and have a YouTube. <laughs> um, no yeah, well, maybe. Yeah, we have one actually. <laughs> we can all no do some follow. dance mo dance moves on inventory management. Don't tempt me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, yeah, um, we got to get you some browser tab management software, out, Joy. I saw how much I, you I know. There. Trust me, trust me. You're not the first one, and yeah. you won't be the last one. <laughs> All right. So thank you guys. Um, any any last messages? Or yeah, we'll look forward to um, seeing you guys on the Slack also. All right. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tim, for joining us as well. Thanks all. Thank, thank you. Bye, Tim. Bye, Stephen. Bye, Bye Joy.